All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Denny. Some of you may know me as Mohawk Matt. I'm assuming I'm all clear. Can I get a thumbs up from Bill or Eric to make sure people can hear me? So I can see them, perfect. Welcome everybody. And we're excited, Naval Alex is excited to present to you some esteemed both some leaders from the Department of the Navy and also just some really, really smart people. Um, have some great insight into what the Department of the Navy is doing right now. Um, but I'll let Ashley tell you more about that. She, she's a smart person as well. I'm not so much. I'm just here to come up with my, my sweet hairdo. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Naval X. So for those who have never heard of it, Naval X is, was created about a year ago, <clears throat> excuse me, by Secretary Gertz. And it is the agility kind of innovation connection cell connected tissue of the Department of the Navy, a newer, uh, newer team. We just turned one. Well, who have a birthday to us about a month ago. So Naval X, we're, we're working there. I see some couple video that smile. Naval X is working to connect experts and solutions to workforce needs and challenges. I know, fancy motto, bunch of words that probably don't mean anything. Who Naval X is? Naval X, we are you. We are the workforce. We are from myself, I am from Naval Air Warfare Center Weapons Division out in China Lake under Nav Air. We got folks with Nav C, Nav, um, Nav War. We got a team full of rotationals from all over the Department of the Navy. It's really exciting. A lot of people think that we're a company, but we truly are part of you, part of the workforce, and we're here to help you. Some of the big things Naval X has going on right now are tech bridges, if you haven't heard about them. And uh, the tech bridge is a way to um, create an ecosystem between industry, I'm using my hands a lot, industry, academia, and the government. And for those of you that may want to work with industry, or if you're on the line and you're with industry, you want to work with the government, reach out to us. Ask us, ask, ask us a question here about tech bridges. We've got some tech bridge folks on the line, and they're happy to help. Another thing is the Centers for Adaptive Warfighting, which is bringing... Um, it's a way to bring some of the tools that are available to industry, like Scrum and human-centered design, lean startup, fancy words you may not know the meaning of. That's cool. Ask us below. A lot of people I answer for you. Um, a way to bring that to the workforce, to the warfighter. We got it's being ran right now by a couple of Marines who are doing a fantastic job and really helping empower the workforce to have the tools and skills they need to solve problems in and do things a little bit different than we have in the past. Um, some other things Naval X are doing is some playbooks. Ask us more in the questions below, and we'll tell you more about the playbooks. If you're interested, it's a way, kind of a recipe of ways to do things and people who have been successful. Um, I do realize I'm talking really fast. I've only got about one more minute, and Ash is going to kick me off. Uh, the big thing I want you to know about Naval X is we are here to help you. There is not... Uh, right way that we're going to help you. We're not going to help everyone the same way. We're here to um, connect you to the things that you need to be connected to inside the Navy, inside the Marine Corps, um, in industry, out in academia. We have a lot, a large network, um, a lot powered and supported by some of the folks on the line today um, that can help you get to, get to your uh, problem solution. We can do that. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ashley. She can kick us off. If you guys have questions about Naval X, you can find us online, follow us on social media, all that fun stuff. But ask questions below. We've got a bunch of team members online right now, and we're happy to help. Ashley, it's all yours. All right. Thanks, Mohawk Matt. I want to introduce our first two speakers for this event. Um, Bill Bray serves as the Deputy Assistant Director for the Navy um, for the Navy for Research Development, Test, and Evaluation under the Secretary, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for research development and acquisition. Mr. Bray is responsible for, uh, execute, for executing um, and oversight of all matters related to rtd and &E budget uh, activities, science and engineering, uh, advanced uh, research and development, prototyping and experimentation, and test and evaluation. He is also responsible for oversight and stewardship of the Department of the Navy Research and Development Establishment, including Naval Laboratories, Warfare Centers, and uh, Syscom. Uh, 
Eric Verhage is a native of Mechanicsburg, uh, oh, excuse me, there is a Mechanicsburg, uh, Maryland, but there's a Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, so he's from Pennsylvania. Uh, he enlisted in the Navy in 1984 and served as electronics technician until his appointment to the Naval Academy. He graduated in 1991 with a Bachelor of Science in Political, uh, a Bachelor of Science in Political Science, and later from the Naval War College in 2008 with a Master's of Arts in National Security and Strategic Studies. Eric is designated surface acquisition professional, and he served in a variety of, of afloat and ashore assignments. Uh, Eric is the commander of the Naval Surface Warfare Center and the Naval personnel, both civil and active duty, at eight war surface warfare center divisions and two undersea warfare divisions. The Naval Sea Warfare Centers provide research, development, test, and evaluation for future Navy, as well as in-service engineering and logistics support for our operational Naval forces. So, Mr. Bray, kick it off, and then Eric, you kick it off after him. Looks like we lost Mr. Bray, so maybe Eric, if you can go first. Can you see okay? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, Ashley and uh, Matt and, and everybody, um, good afternoon. Um, I have, there may be a few people on the net to argue. Um, with me, but I think I got the best job in the Navy, at least for another week or so. I give a thank you to Naval X, your focus on connecting and sharing and um, and just um, for acquisition mission better. I love I love your mission, and I'm uh, appreciative. I know many of us are appreciative of your your efforts uh, on our behalf. Um, my Still live, you're able to hear me? I see Mr. Bray. Um, Mr. Bray, can you hear me? Yeah, I see. Uh, yes, okay. All right, so I'll continue. Um, so, one of the questions I was asked to speak a little bit about is um, and just how we've been reacting to the COVID uh, uh, challenge um, and, and maybe a little bit on um, what makes Warfare Centers, uh, what's allowed us to control. One is, um, um, we get 27,000 amazing scientists and engineers and work together with our contractor and industry and the PEOs uh, for the fleet and, and, and sometimes uh, via the, our PEOs. And they've got this amazing blend. And, and I saw John. <laughs> been a challenge for sure. Um, of the 27,000 or so folks, we've got um, almost 90% teleworking right now. And we need to come to work because they're supporting either a depot or they're an IMA or they're fixing periscopes or, or torpedoes, you know, or building um, radars. So they're, they're able to continue their mission, um, spread them out and have them over two different shifts. And, um, you know, 
trying to make use of technology to speed up in the most efficient and effective way. And it's affecting teammates and unable to get more done because they've been freed from other distractions. Um, none of us have a commute, which is pretty awesome. In some ways, I'm hoping that we're, we're definitely learning lessons with COVID that will continue for the, for the long term. Uh, across the 10 warfare center divisions and detachments and sites, uh, we're helping figure out what is the right way to clean our ships and what kind of fabric and materials are the best face masks and how can we use ultraviolet light to, um, you know, to sanitize things. We have folks awarding contracts and short notice. Indian Head comes to mind um, with their um, fires panels, which are really uh, sensors and ways that we can test for the COVID virus and other. Found and hard at work. Tracks, uh, UV hand sensors, uh, things that we can use to screen packages and materials before they get on our ships. Right, the, the list goes on and on. Some awesome thing and. and added to manufacturing, and um, one of our divisions, Panama City, was um, one of, I think, 100 entries in the DOD uh, challenge. And they've got two of their entries, excuse me, are, you know, towards the very top breathing units, um, because we've been, we don't have enough uh, ventilators. One of them is actually getting emergency FDA approval. So just broadly, we got awesome people, all the right authorities. We've got uh, contracts, acquisition, the uh, cooperative uh, research and development. And I would say years of effort to give us those authorities are paying off during this difficult time. So, over. So, hey, this is Bill Bray again. Um, don't know what happened. Hey, we're not able to hear you, sir. I think we lost him again. Right, who has the most bandwidth? I'm sure what have four kids. I probably who's competing for your bandwidth, Mr. Bragg. But, uh, We see you again. All right, maybe the third time's a charm. We do see you, and I think we'll be able to hear you. I apologize for this. Whitney, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Um, so apologize. Not sure what's happening. I, I keep getting cut off. So, uh, but as I was saying, that's you know the the thing we're dealing with today with the pandemic, COVID nineteen, really requires resiliency and adaptability in everything you do, and uh, clearly we're we're adapting here as we go. Um, 
Hey, uh, I just want to talk to you about a couple things. I thought I'd start off a little bit about resiliency and in my perspective what that really means, um, both uh, for the workforce, uh, the nation, and how we, how we move forward. Uh, kind of roll that into how I'm trying to operationalize that at the, the DASM level. And then uh, end with a little bit about the Joint Acquisition Task Force that Ms. Lord has uh, stood up <clears throat> and talk a little bit about how the Navy's point in that space, in particular the warfare centers and labs, but really across the entire enterprise. Um, so resiliency, you know, uh, to me it's, it's about adaptability, uh, creativity with a, uh, a, a little bit of uh, discipline added in. I know I've been teleworking off and on at home. Um, a lot of times things go pretty well, sometimes they don't. I uh, just like the challenge we, we just had. And so being able to, to think through that, be um, a little bit of MacGyver in you, figure out how do you solve the problem or solution, and be able to move forward is really, really a key. And I think that's one of the aspects of resiliency that is very, very important. Being able to problem solve, work through issues, and still uh, effectively uh, uh, get what you need done. Um, Part of that is you got to kind of you can't allow yourself to get frustrated, can't allow yourself to get down. You got to be able to connect out, talk to folks, uh, stay rel relatively balanced, and uh, and and really strive for what you can get done given the environment you're in. Um, pursuing perfection, but recognizing sometimes these are challenging environments and uh, you may not be able to, to to accomplish exactly what you want. So. Setting expectations, um, you know, one way I try to do that is set up a, a solid uh, calendar, telework calendar, something I can follow through, leaving space in between. So when things don't go right or I need to do something different, I could I could adapt and change as it goes. Um, and then being being able to be uh, confident in, in in the way you're doing things, working out on your own, but also have that um, ability to reach out to others. Uh, you know, your, your call out for help as you go to, to really be able to continue to pursue uh, what you need to get done and be able to accomplish what you, what you need to have. And when you need help, reach out to get that help and assistance. Um, the last thing I would say, and as, as a leadership tool, the thing I've learned going through this environment, but as well as some other challenging uh, uh, things that I've been involved with is staying calm and being able to communicate well uh, a, a, as you deal with the, the stress and the changing environment. Um, I believe communication is, is extremely, extremely important um, a, as you kind of try to work with others, uh, trying to use the phone, trying to communicate on things like this, um, being able to, to um, uh, listen in, empathically. You know, it's one thing to be able to just talk and talk and talk, communication goes two ways. And so being able to listen to your team, your folks, your family, your friends, understand what challenges they're going through, try to assist uh, is equally important as verbally communicating out. So um, uh, those are kind of some of the things that I try to, try to use as, as I deal with, with the current situation. You know, at the DASM level, uh, I, I'm working big picture policy uh, items, really looking across the board. How do I effectively communicate with those, with my team, both within my staff, but also broadly uh, those leaders out at the warfare centers and labs or the syscom. So I've kind of set up a, a weekly drumbeat with each of those groups so I can stay connected with them uh, on a regular basis and I hold myself to those. Uh, whether it's a 30-minute meeting with my test and evaluation team or a 30-minute meeting with my naval research and develop, uh, development establishment team um, or, or broadly out to the EDs at the warfare centers and labs. How are things going? What's going well? What's not going well? How can I help at the DASM level, at the big picture? What barriers can I help knock down? What uh, opportunities can I help us pursue? And so that's kind of been the way I've been trying to operate over the last two or three weeks. Um, I've done a little bit of teleworking, a little bit of work in the Pentagon, uh, probably more teleworking, and I found it to be 
extremely, extremely effective uh, for me uh, working at home. Although I got to tell you, I do miss the face-to-face -face contact and being able to talk to my team, um, you know, one-on-one -on -one or as a group and getting together. I, I am a people person, so getting out and talking to folks, uh, that's probably the one challenge in a telework environment. Uh, but I would say right now, I feel like things have been going very effective. Um, things we've been trying to do is really, um, you know, effectively staff documents electronically for signature for myself or to Mr. Gertz up at the RDA level. Um, looking at how do we take advantage of SharePoint, uh, other tools, communication tools that are out there. I, you know, when I'm working at home, I've got my personal computer that I'm operating right here. I got my regular computer. I've got two cell phones and my iPad. And uh, when I first started, it, it was confusing to me. But I would say, as I've kind of gotten uh, moving, things have worked out pretty well. Um, so I think that communication piece is really, really key. That proactive leadership of reaching out to your team, making sure they're doing okay, making sure we're operating well, and uh, and uh, we're taking on the issues that, and the barriers that are out there. Um, we've done a lot of that over the last two or three years, I think, for the Naval Research and Development Establishment as a whole, the Warfare Centers and Labs, and hopefully we're seeing that. I think we are enabling us to be able to be adaptable uh, not being reactive, but being proactive and be able to get things done, whether it's through contracting initiatives, uh, the way we are operating, the telework aspect, the tools that have been provided out to, to folks to use. And, and then I just kind of want to hand with big picture JADA. So Joint Acquisition Task Force. Um, a lot of people don't understand, uh, you know, the lead for this national emergency really is FEMA, and the HHS uh, uh, department. And we in the DOD are, are a supporting agency to them as we go forward. So Ms. Lord stood up uh, an organization called the Joint Acquisition Task Force. Uh, it is a, uh, a task force from across all the services in the acquisition community. And I've been acting on behalf of Mr. Gertz as uh, kind of a senior executive connection point into that organization. The connection points are a lot like Naval Um So participating in daily phone calls and reacting to what DOD at the big picture needs, how the Navy can help provide that, and then, uh, and then really all that in support of how, what FEMA needs uh, going forward. So we immediately stood up things like an additive manufacturing cell which I relied heavily on the system commands as well as the warfare centers and labs. A lot of additive manufacturing capability out there at the shipyards, et cetera. How do we take advantage of that to support the national, national means and the FEMA requirements in HHS? Um, we, we brought in analytical support from across the warfare centers and labs. Uh, the request came in to support how do we look at supply chains in the medical area and how do we take advantage of that and maximize that. So again, knowing the, the capabilities out there, we shut the warfare centers and, and got a handful of folks that stand by functionally in support of DOD. Uh, contracting, you know, pull together a contract team to do a quick response to looking at the proposals that have come in regarding things like masks and ventilators and test equipment and diagnostic equipment and then the general technology expertise that's out there. So being able to pull that in and, and bring, that, bring that forward. And then, uh, and then I would just say, um, you know, the, the last thing uh, I would say is, is looking downward for Navy support and how we support Navy. So continue to use all that expertise and technology to, to help support the Navy and, uh, and uh, um, you know, really help our war fighters as well as our workers in the shipyards and and going out to the fleet to be able to maximize the capabilities. So from my viewpoint, those are some of the things that we've been working on, both from a personal, how do we adapt to this environment, to how we contributed to the broader COVID-19 fight, and then to the, uh, to the war fighter that's out there within the Navy and the Marine Corps. So with that, I, I think uh, I'm going to stop. It looks like my screen flows up. So uh, uh, I don't know if I need to re reestablish. Hopefully you heard all that. Whitney, I'm going to 
turn it over and uh, head it over to you. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, and sorry about this. I just wanted to let everyone know this is the first time we're piloting this tool for such a large scale event. Uh, it's one of the only tools that allows for uh, web broadcasting and allows non uh, non cap holders to join the call. So sorry about every technical issue that we're having. We're definitely doing the best we can and learning uh, as we go. Um, but Bill and Eric have been great support so far. Um, I'd love to turn it over to questions. So um, for everyone who's on here, if you could take a look at the part of your screen to the bottom left. Uh, it says ask questions here. Feel free to uh, actually input some questions that we can ask Bill and Eric. Um, and then in the meantime, I do have some questions that I've already uh, worked on for you guys. So I will uh, make my own small if I can. Uh, the first question I have um, is for Bill, actually. Um, so we'll see if, that, we'll see if that works out. Bill, we can hear you just fine if you don't mind being a little frozen. Um, but uh, you have. You know, the bird's eye view uh, from the Joint Task Force, and you were, you were talking about the additive manufacturing side from the national level, and then also a lot of the local level efforts that you're seeing and that Eric's seeing. Um, how difficult is it to coordinate between those two, and, and are they um, are they kind of activating in very separate trajectories, or is there overlap in that process? Sure, it's a great question, Whitney. Um, I, I would say um, it, it's actually within the Navy, and, and kind of I, I, I put myself in between the two, the OSD demand signal, and then what does the Navy need? Uh, what I found is the Navy has been very uh, responsive in being able to stand up, step up, and frankly, very proactive. We were doing a lot of things internal to the Navy um, that that I think others were thinking about. A lot of the additive manufacturing immediately was popping up from across the different warfare centers and labs. How can we help? How can we create shields and and get them out to the medical uh, into, uh, hospitals and things of that nature? So I, I saw immediately the grassroots efforts from the warfare centers. Um, it's been a little bit challenging to the OSD level, um, primarily because we are waiting for demand signals from HHS and FEMA. You know, we cannot just run in there and say, hey, here's a OSD contract that we can go buy, you know, 10, 10 million ventilators or 10 million masks, and we're going to go pursue it. So, um, so, you know, FEMA and HHS has been standing up as we've been standing up. And so getting that demand signal has been a challenge. But I think we've, we've, over the last two or three weeks, both at the OSD level and the Navy, have really been organizing and setting ourselves up so when the demand signal comes in, we can, we can execute very quickly. And the example I would give you was, most recently, many of you may have seen in the uh, uh, papers, the Battelle sterilization of masks uh, effort. Uh, that was a technology that was being worked uh, FEMA identified that as a demand signal. OSD was able to work through that. I believe it was DLA or the Air Force was able to set up a contract. The money flowed from FEMA, got on contract, and now we are procuring the capability to get out there to our medical uh, communities to really be able to sterilize those N95 masks and other masks very rapidly. And that would not have been ready. Uh, we would not have been able to do it as rapidly or as coordinated if we didn't set up this this approach here. So, so there's some glitches. I know there's a lot of people that wanted to move very quickly in a lot of areas, um, but you do have to wait for that demand signal uh, for for the national support. But you know, about two weeks ago, Mr. Gertz put out a note a memo that really really encouraged the worker centers and labs to. If you can, at the local level, support, please do so and do what you can do, given the inherent capabilities you have. And so we try to be aggressive, proactive, yet add a little bit of that fiscal discipline to make sure we don't get ourselves in trouble down the road and can support the, the Navy need as well as the national need. Over.
You're on mute, Whitney. Whitney, we, we can't hear you, Whitney. No one can hear you. Great. Awesome. <laughs> All right. I'll repeat myself. Perfect. Sorry, guys. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, so the question was from a Captain Health Doctor. Uh, I apologize. Uh, firstly, thank you guys for participating. And then the question is, uh, what transformative capabilities or processes do you see the Navy taking advantage of during the COVID crisis that will be an enduring improvement? So, Eric, if you have any thoughts on that. Um, well, I think we're not going back. I think this is a long journey. If we're teleworking or practicing social distancing for a long time. So, in some areas, we're actually more efficient with telework, and contracting comes to mind. And maybe business, uh, financial, you know, financial, uh, uh, investments have been made to increase bandwidth and to um, we've already we already had uh, uh, a lot of pieces in three three thousand NMCI seats almost every one of them to work with give people some flexibility and to be able to work anywhere uh, We're not going back. Uh, we'll leverage those technology that increase. As far as the technology, I think um, we'll have to see where that goes. I have a, an example of, I know we're pursuing uh, UV sensors and um, um, ways to sanitize uh, materials and goods and, and uh, pushing procedures out along the, the entirety of the Navy, but NAVC is that um, to help. The technology perspective, I'm not sure where it's going to go. I see Mr. Gertz with his mask right there. Yeah. Sorry from a business practice. <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll take a quick pause and we'll return to these, uh, these questions uh, in a little bit. So, I don't, I don't think you really need much of an introduction. Uh, but uh, welcome, and uh, Phil and Eric, why don't we all hop off for a little bit and come back uh, when Honda's done. All right, guys, we are, uh, everybody hear me all right? Give me a thumbs up. All right, we are, uh, we are adapting and overcoming here, so I'm sitting out here on the uh, bench outside the Pentagon because uh, uh, for anybody that's been in the Pentagon, you'll know quickly that there's any Wi-Fi or network you think you have there, it doesn't exist. And so, uh, so I'm out here enjoying a uh, afternoon out on the out on the bench here in the Pentagon. Hey, um, I just got a couple of uh, comments to start with, and then uh, from there we'll go uh, into questions for you. And and again, my kind of message for everybody is uh, is pretty basic. Um, I'm going to ask you to do kind of three things, right? Um, focus on yourself. If you're not healthy, if you aren't uh, connected, if you aren't um, keeping healthy, uh, and you aren't realistic about what your situation is, um, that's not going to do us any good. And so we're all going through lots of uh, interesting challenges here. Um, what some of you are doing in terms of being able to be at home with three kids and being a combination of uh, awesome uh, worker for the Department of the Navy and mom and dorm room uh, manager and cook and bottle washer and whatever else simultaneously is uh, pretty darn impressive. Um, and I don't have to tell you how challenging that can be. I can't even just manage myself and my dog, uh, much less all that. Um, but keep realistic uh, and understand uh, don't beat yourself up too bad if, if that's hard. Uh, and and you've got to learn and, and work through it. So you know, my first kind of message to you is uh, keep it real. Uh, reaching out for help or saying, hey, you need to adapt or I need to take a little time or something, is uh, is not only um, 
uh, good, it's realistic. And uh, keeping it real is really important for us. So, you know, first uh, focus on yourself and get yourself where you need to be. Uh, and if you need some help, don't be afraid to reach out. The second piece I'd say is um, focus on your team. Uh, again, everybody's coming from different directions. We're all learning how to do this uh, at scale. And uh, your team can be a great source of resilience. Uh, understand where they're struggling and where you can pick up some uh, slack or where you need a little help and they can pick up some slack and, uh, and really adapt and overcome. I've been really amazed at our collective output we have generated um, in these uh, kind of new conditions. Uh, to put it in perspective, you know, one of the things I asked everybody to do was, you know, trying to accelerate our work. Uh, we've obligated about a third more at this point uh, in the year uh, than we've done than we did last year, uh, with about five percent less uh, contract actions. Uh, so that means we have moved about another almost thirty billion dollars into the industrial base. Put that in work for the warfighter um, while we're in this condition, and so. Uh, so that's done with a lot of teamwork, uh, working together and, and, uh, and figuring out how um, we're distributed, but we're not uh, alone. And then the last piece I would say is really stay focused on the mission. Um, understand what's important. Uh, I think we're all finding tasks we were doing that we thought impacted the mission, but we have now found didn't. Uh, so stop doing those. Uh, and then find out the things that really do impact the mission. Uh, so being engaged with your uh, counterparts, uh, being engaged with the fleet, uh, reaching out and understanding problems before they become crises uh, are all kind of important things. So I think if, you, if we can all do those three things, uh, focus on ourselves, keep ourselves healthy, that's mind, body, spirit, um, focus on our team, whether that's our home team or our uh, work team, right? And then focus on the mission, making sure for the work uh, we're expending, we're expending it on the most important stuff. Uh, and then I guess my last uh, uh, thing, we had a good session yesterday at the leadership level, but it applies to everybody, is don't get completely consumed in the moment right now and working through the delay and disruption. Because the real key to us is how do we come out of this stronger, better, more resilient, more capable, not how do we come out and be what we were uh, a month ago. Uh, I think, you know, this crisis, there's nothing like a good crisis to uh, shake off some of our preconceived notions, some of the, you know, non-value-added bureaucracy. You know, we, uh, we amp the ship up, put her in heavy seas. Uh, that's shaking off some barnacles. Now, we don't want to let those barnacles grow back. Uh, we want to stay rigged for speed. And so as we come out of this, uh, don't get completely consumed with today. Think about where we want to be and shoot for a higher target than where we were. We do a lot together. I think we'll uh, we'll continue to do awesome things for the Navy. And so, with that as kind of an intro, uh, I'm happy to figure out if I can understand how to take questions here. Uh, so, all right, first question. Hang on a sec. Now I got old eyes, so it's not going to help me either. All right. Um, uh, I can start off. Uh, I can a I can ask the questions if you want, or you can read. It's up to you. Yeah, go once you ask me, Whitney, because I got some glare here that makes it a little tough on me, on the old eyes. Yeah, I got it. Uh, well, not really, but uh, number one, uh, how have you adapted your leadership style to meet the needs of your workforce, sailors, Marines, partners, et cetera, during this time? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think luckily, um, or fortunately for me, you know, my time at, at Special Operations Command and kind of managing uh, in crisis, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of traits there I've been able to draw on and scar tissue when, when I didn't know what to do then and learn. Uh, some of it is be very explicit in guidance, uh, but make that guidance intent-based and not procedurally based. Uh, so here is kind of what I want us to do. Take care of yourself, take care of your team, take care of the mission, but I'm not going to tell you how to do it. I'm going to give you that as a goal and then rely on you to figure it out. And then uh, we've all got to, I think, um, err on a, a key lesson that I've learned over time, especially when we're in this distributed kind of thing, is err to the side of caution, um, give people the benefit of the doubt. It's really easy to read into an email or a voicemail or something. Now think the best of people and understand people all have, uh, for the most part, really good intentions. Um, if If you take the other approach and you're skeptical of everything you can uh, you can really um, 
cause a lot of problems. You can start reading things in there. So if, if we all think the best of everybody and we try and do our best, um, that really helps. And I've got to do the same thing, right? I hear a piece of information or a snippet of information, and it's easy to go on, the, okay, and I, I need to go solve that problem, or it's, uh, you know, somebody's not doing something. I found if I slow down a little bit, uh, try and take my emotion out of it, take my preconceived notion out, and really kind of um, think through the problem and think that people are trying to do their best, that, that really helps. So I don't know if it's changed the leadership style. I think we've been fortunate over the last couple of years. We've all been working hard on um, getting better at decentralizing and trusting each other. Uh, that trust and transparency is the thing that will be most important as we work our way through this. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the second question uh, we have is actually on uh, your LinkedIn usage. So you're one of the most uh, publicly recognized leaders that we have, uh, and you've been posting a lot of things on iconic music, uh, thought-provoking questions, and really helping the workforce stay in touch. Uh, how did you get that started? And then also, uh, what's the response? So, um, so it's interesting. I do. Uh, while I've got an awesome public affairs team here, um, I don't have public affairs doing uh, LinkedIn. It's kind of me sitting on the couch with the dog and uh, and kind of reflective. I find particularly in these times, um, again, going back to keeping it real. You know, everybody can try and have the facade that everything's perfect, and you know, I'm the omnipresent. You know. Uh, leader that understands everything. That's not the case. I'm I'm going through the same stresses everybody else is, or that's home stress or uh, new boss stress. I seem to have lots of new bosses lately, um, or or all the other kinds of things. Um, and so I find talking about it and being uh, uh, realistic about it helps. It's therapeutic to me to hear from. I learn I learned a ton on LinkedIn. I learn what people are thinking about. I learn what they're stressing about and. Uh, I think it's just another good communications channel. Uh, you know, back to the leadership style question. Um, as uh, as a leader, you cannot communicate enough. I had an old boss that said, you know, communicate ten times more than you think you need to, and you've reached ten percent of your audience. And so for me, it's another way to get uh, diverse ideas, inputs, uh, and another venue to reach people who maybe I can't reach on a regular day, and, and quite frankly, I learn a lot from them. Uh, so we are getting a lot of questions on digital tools uh, that are being it, used. It, it that be pause you real quick. Okay. So uh, a lot of people actually don't know who Hondo is. So I know I know him as Hondo. A lot of people know him as Secretary Gertz. I just want to let people know right now you're listening to Secretary J Jim Gertz. He is the Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research Development Acquisition. He also makes a mean roadside chili, and he loves making his own salsa. So just to fill people in, that's kind of who we've been talking to right now. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I'll pay you back for that. Thanks, Matt. I'm, I'm working on my mohawk here. I'll have my uh, I'll have my ponytail and mohawk pretty soon. Thanks. Sounds good, sir. I'll come on over. Hook you up. Thanks, Matt. Um, so yeah, we, we were getting a lot of different questions about the ranges of tools, uh, digital and otherwise, that are being used now uh, during this time. And there's a question on whether the progress being made is going to last uh, after the COVID response or not. Not that you're uh, able to read the future, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, getting to my kind of main point, you can't just think about returning to where we were. Uh, and so this has been a little bit of a, you know, we need to take advantage, you know, if you have an abundance thinking, uh, or abundance mindset, right, we got an abundance of challenges right now. We also have an abundance of people experimenting with new ways of doing work and learning things. I think I read this morning we had 300,000 people in the Department of the Navy teleworking today. You know, a month or two ago, nobody could have even conceived of 30,000 people teleworking, or, you know, if I would have told each team, half your team's going to telework, I would have had, you know, 10,000 reasons, and I would have been the first one to say, there's no way that's going to work and everything's going to fall apart. Um, so I think we're proving new things to ourselves. 
we've got to be ruthless about the things that we want to continue, uh, the things we want to reinvent, and the things we don't want to ever do again. And so I think tools fall into that category. You know, the tools themselves are not nearly as important as the mindset and the culture of the people using the tools. If you got the mindset and the culture right, the tools will take care of themselves. If you don't, the tools will take care of themselves. Uh, and so I think what I'm looking for out of everybody is what's working? What do we want to continue? Uh, I, I kind of put things in three bins, right? What do we want to sustain? What do we want to improve? And what do we want to build? Uh, and just never do again. And so I would ask for, we're going to be collecting up uh, all those lessons learned, both in terms of, of process and tool set. Um, we're taking advantage of this to, to look at greenfield solutions and a whole different way of thinking through how we've done IT before. We're doing that in parallel with managing the crisis. Um, but what I really need from, from everybody that they're working, you know, at the deck plate level is what really makes a difference and what doesn't so that we can double down on the things that make a difference and then get rid of the stuff that doesn't. Over. Awesome. Okay, uh, so another question came in. Uh, with the current... Maybe Whitney, just one more. I guess you've got my commitment also that we're not going to backtrack just for backtrack sake. Um, and so I'll be your advocate uh, for the team on the stuff that works. Again, that doesn't mean we have 19 different chat tools and 35 different of something, but the tools that really make a difference. I see us working much more in this mode um, going into the future than, again, reverting to where we were. Because part of what we've got to do as a team is build some resilience personally at the team level and at the tool level so that, you know, my sense is we're going to have some multiple waves of disruption and we can't have every disruption uh, drop drop down kind of performance. We've got to be able to build our resilience uh, to operate in it. Uh, and so I just need to know from you guys the tools that are really working, and uh, I'll be your advocate to keep uh, fighting on them. So I'm sorry. If we Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so re remember, folks, that means, that means he just told you to tell him what does and doesn't work. So you just got authority to keep track of what's working, what's not working. So we want you guys to send that in to Naval X, put it in the comments here, send it to our email at agility at navy.mil. This is, this is the chance to. Uh, yeah, so another question, um, just on what has been the most impressive thing you've noticed so far uh, since it started? Um, I would say two things. Um, at the personal level, uh, people's individual resiliency to, again, I know some of you are, you know, moms or dads to three kids, uh, you know, home, you know, parents to two dogs and three cats and have kids home from college and, uh, you know, trying to do all that in a case where you don't have the boundaries of being able to drive home to work or drive to work and then drive home um, is really, really impressive. And the way everybody's been able to do that and manage that is at the individual level, I think, uh, certainly worth recognition. Uh, the other is, I think, you know, again, our team output has gone up when we're at about 95 to 97 percent telework. Uh, that wouldn't happen if we didn't have a good team mindset going in and then an adapt and overcome mindset as we're into this. And so um, I think our challenge will be how to sustain that and how to make that work on new products, not just working on products that we had kind of 75 percent done when we went into this. Uh, some of the creativeness has been impressive. And doing industry days virtually uh, has been super impressive. Some of the things we've rethought how we train uh, train people, how we do tech assist. So now we don't have to fly people around the globe. We can figure out how to do remote tech assist. So it's really um, folks' ability to just stay, understand mission intent and translate that into action. Don't wait for permission uh, and do the right thing has been, you know, there's not one thing I've can think of in five weeks where I've said, uh, that was wrong, go undo it, or you were speeding, or you did something inappropriate. Um, I have, that doesn't even cross my mind. My, my mind is about what are we learning, how, how do we get that across the fleet the most uh, quickly. Uh, and for a team this big to have that is, uh, yeah, I've been on some great teams, uh, that's pretty darn remarkable. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I, I think I recall you telling our team, just don't break the law. So I <laughs> appreciate that. Um, let's see. So another question we have is, how is the Navy reaching out to small businesses? Are you doing things differently under COVID-19 guidance? Yeah, I mean, I've put some guidance out there, so I would a little bit of ask you, how are you reaching out to the small business? Uh, you know, at my level, in fact, today I just had, uh, I think we had 30 different small business shipyards presidents on the line. Uh, I meet every other day with shipyard presidents kind of at our larger yards. Uh, today we did one with 30 of the smaller uh, shipyards to get a sense, you know, what are their struggles, uh, opportunities. Um, but we, we, we know, again, if kind of go back to my top three, right, take care of yourself, take care of your team, be part of a team, and then uh, be part of the mission. That team and mission piece is uh, reaching out to all of your uh, all of your performers. I think ONR this week reached out to every one of its performers, something like 2,500 of their performers at the individual, uh, each performer level. Uh, you know, person to person, making a phone call, connecting. Uh, you know, not just sending a, a distribution all email. I tell you, that goes a long way. When I talk to industry, um, they they the trust and the transparency and the connectedness that we have um, in the Department of Navy is unlike any other services, uh, and that really gives us a lot of strength, right? The speed of trust is really important, and we're in, we're in a situation. Anybody there? Hey Matt. Hey All Matt. Right. This is Ashley. Are you there? All right. You got me waiting. Okay. I think we lost Hondo briefly, potentially for more than a minute. Uh, let's see. I'll let Danny know, and we can come back when he's ready. All right. Yeah, Eric, that'd be great. Um, I yeah, so a uh, couple things. I really like um, that you said raised our also our purchase card up to 20K and our acquisition in two. That was specifically for the purpose of. Admin burden and, and help a little faster. We've actually set a goal for each of the workers. Use those 233 authorities and uh, hours of uh, uh, a that he was given us that is, you know, we've, we've saved over 54,000 hours over the last couple of years. Our goal is about 12 less than what we'd like to be. We're making every use of those authorities to try to go. Point. We shouldn't go back. Ray and I have a stack of stuff waiting to be separate items. And that's the grassroots at the work. We are others to um, try to push things down to the workforce so we can go a little. Chris Lawson, I see a question about my. I don't know if I have a mic or where that microphone is. So that really could be. Well, it is coming across all right as long as you're a little bit closer and trying to face forward at the screen. It's, it's a little bit easier. From an engaging industry, you know, visions. Uh, we're trying to push money to the to uh, to our industry partners. The same way Secretary Gertz has asked that to be done with the shipyards and the centers. We're doing the same thing with our industry base, and a lot of it is small business. But just for example, in March, our estimate we were gonna we thought maybe award about 
was 500 mil. Make sure that our industry partners are healthy and can confidently pace. We've been, and Denise Abraham, our contracting lead, has been partnering with DCMA and others to kind of not to make sure that we're not uh, doing withholding, um, basically releasing more money to our industry. Checking in, engaging, using our OTAs, continuing to partner with our creatives and, and other entities like that. And then just push money out uh, as soon as we can. They can have. Uh, John um, Moretti and uh, will probably have some other ideas. Ways that we've been doing it. Awesome. Uh, I think I have one more question uh, for a say for Bill. We'll see. We'll see how that goes. Uh, last question is on, uh, you know, when there are a lot of different activities that need to be stopped, uh, whether it's testing and evaluation or exercises um, during this time, how do you decide which, go, uh, which exercises continue and which ones need to uh, take a second seat to this? Hey, okay, I, I think I, was that for me? Okay, uh, so good question. Um, a couple things I would tell you. I, th I think, uh, the, again, back to that resiliency, what I started with, I would say the warfare centers and labs and the test ranges that support them has been very, um, very adaptable and has been able to execute a lot of the events that, that were originally planned and continue to do it as best they can using social distancing as well. I know we had a report from, I believe it was Dahlgren, that was doing soft kill coordinator work um, and doing some testing in-house lab, doing it together uh, with the industry team as well as themselves. And they were able to execute the event as scheduled online and uh, and get it done to keep the program within schedule. And uh, I've seen that happening across the board, whether it's fleet support, whether it's actual testing to support programs and programs of record. Um, so to date, and, and one of the questions we have, for instance, uh, we talked with uh, the China Lake folks. And they've been able to continue to do a lot of the testing that was required. It, they're doing it very carefully, very structured, a structured a way, being, but being able to get that done. Um, the other thing that uh, I, I've seen from, again, an adaptability standpoint, when it is lab testing or the requirement of using uh, classified facilities, uh, I've seen a lot of the Warfare Center's labs, the, the UARCs, the University Applied Research Centers, really uh, getting adaptive by going 24-hour shifts. Now, that is not uh, the best way to operate. However, it can minimize traffic and the amount of people that have to be at the lab at any one time. So, so for classified events, we've seen a lot of, a lot of efforts where They've been, uh, you know, segmented hours of time throughout the day or throughout the 24-hour day period to be able to get that done. Um, but I guess I would default back to mission essential. What is mis mission essential, both from a, a war fighting as well as a programmatic standpoint? And those are those would be number one. And uh, you know, we've tried to push that so it's the decisions are being made at the the right command level. And then non-essential would be the ones that would be would be pushed over. Thank you, Mr. Bray. Uh, yeah, the only thing I can add, Bray is um, is just it's a lot of talking with our fleet sponsors, with our PEOs, to try to make sure that um, we got priorities. We've been able to support a lot, but in some instances. We've been um, 
you know, weren't able to support, uh, just didn't have enough technicians and the 14 day uh, ROM and a whole bunch of other things that have just challenged us. Um, and we, we've done a pretty good job of keeping a lot of it on track and, um, and we Hey, hey uh, Whitney, this is Bill Bray. Can I, can I chime in a little bit on the small business as well as the question earlier on capability that the worker centers may have and how they contribute? Oh, yes, Bill. Go ahead and share. One, yeah, one of the things I wanted to mention, and I see some of the questions out there, hey, we have this capability. How do we get that out there? How do we get funding? One of the things the Joint Acquisition Task Force did was it established a DOD portal on AFWorks that allows, whether it's small business, whether it's big business in the industry, or workforce centers and labs, if you have a capability or technology, uh, I recommend you go into that. Again, it's on the AFWorks and should be like the DOD portal. If you need to follow up with anybody, my guy working that is Wes, Wesley Hill. He's on my staff. He can get the, the info for you. But that's a way to get the good ideas, the capabilities that you may have that you've been working on into um, a place where it can be considered. We do have technical teams that are supporting the assessment of those technologies uh, to figure out which ones are the right ones to go forward with. Um, so I just put that out there for Uh, so it looks like we have time for one more question. Uh, it should be a good one. Uh, let's see, has this been covered? Uh, should every warfare center be encouraged to provide outreach to their communities, um, whether it's through the mayor's office to coordinate with local hospitals to help with PPE and ventilators, or should folks be waiting on some larger level uh, uh, requests to be made? Uh, Bill, that's it for both of you, I think, yeah. Hey, so um, let me tell you, um, you know, our warfare centers are in their communities. They're connected. Um, you know, Corona had 50 universities and colleges within 50 miles. Um, we had an industry partner. Uh, I was uh, on personal, first name basis with the mayors of three cities, Corona with and are always in dialogue with those community partners. COVID times, confident we're, we're coordinating closely. So um, I, I think we're... We Certainly the response I'm seeing center. from all the warfare centers, so that's, that's great news. All right, Ashley, hey, well, do you want to well, lead us uh, in the next up, Yeah, I was just going to say while they're queuing up, thank you for everyone for uh, being patient again. We know it's frustrating. We're trying to use the tools that we're allowed to use and not use things that aren't approved. So we really do appreciate you staying on the line and staying with us for this. Back to you, Whitney. Yep. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say the same thing. Thanks so much for bearing with us and, and going through these tools. Uh, for the presenters and for the listeners, it's not it's not an easy task. So uh, really appreciate it. Um, if we want to turn on our videos and stuff off, uh, Ashley's going to lead us into the next panel. And those panelists can feel free to test out their own uh, video and audio at this time. OK, guys. So. Uh, thank you for bearing with us again. Uh, thank you, Bill and Eric, for joining us. I uh, just want to um, let you guys know just to answer, uh, ask all your questions to the um, uh, in the section to your left. That's the official uh, question and answer forum. Uh, as well as before you guys uh, get off, uh, we do have a brief survey we'd like to um, get you guys' feedback on on how this is going on. Um, as I wait for the uh, next four panelists to uh, join, I'm just going to read a little bit of their bios. Um, first up, we will have uh, Rich Carlin. He is the department head for the office, the new Office of Naval Research's Accelerator Department. Uh, the overreaching, uh, overarching goal of the Naval Accelerator is to create 
an agile innovative ecosystem across academia, the Naval Research and Development Establishment, and small business. Importantly, working directly with Naval X and the Tech Bridges, Rich and his team have been employing a, a local and regional collaboration model to achieve their goal. Um, and this model is providing, uh, is proving to be an ef um, effective for the COVID-19 response. Um, after that, we will have Cindy Waters. She is the Senior Science Technology Manager for the um, Principal for Additive Manufacturing and Advanced Materials at Naval Surface Warfare Center, Carterock. She previously served as, um, for 20 years in academia as a researcher and professor. A uh, little tidbit, she was actually my professor in college, so uh, I love Cindy. <laughs> uh, Cindy focuses her efforts at the Warfare Center in collaborating with various governments, labs, and universities to find and transition research into the fleet. In the current COVID crisis, she is leveraging the materials and additive manufacturing expertise of the Navy, as well as other networks to provide real-time critical research-based um, evidence for decisions uh, the VA and FDA are making uh, to ramp up in uh, production of PPE. Uh, PPE is a personal protective equipment. Uh, after Cindy comes on, uh, we, will, we will have uh, John Moretti. He is the commanding officer of the Naval Undersea Warfare Center Division at Keyport and uh, Naval Sea and Systems Command Science and Technology Organization with 2,300 employees and the Department's Defense in the Department of Defense's only warfare center in the Pacific Northwest. John is a career submarine officer who holds a bachelor's degree in science, electrical engineering from Oregon State, a master's of business administration from San Diego State University, and a master's of arts in strategic studies and national security from Naval Warfare on the Naval War College. His 30-year career includes command of an Ohio class, Trident submarine, uh, the USS Henry uh, M. M. Jackson and an acquisition experience. And lastly, but not least, we will have Daniel Edlick. He is the 86th commander of Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, one of our great nations for public uh, uh, depots, maintenance facilities that uh, performs overhaul, maintenance, and modernization of our nuclear powered warships. Portsmouth, Portsmouth Naval Shipyard is loca located in Kittery, Maine, and has approximately 65,000, 6,500. Um, civil service employees. Previously, Dan has served at Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard in Hawaii, Naval Intermediate uh, Maintenance Facility Pac uh, Pacific Northwest in Bangor, Washington, uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Baghdad, Iraq, and Submarine Squadron 11 in San Diego. His career has included service abroad, submarines, teaching assignments, and his recent stint as a business and strategic planning at Puget Naval, Na uh, excuse me, at Puget uh, Sound Shipyard. So first off, we're going to have Rich. He's going to talk about uh, the Tech Bridge efforts at uh, Keyport and Newport and in Alaska and in, in Hawaii. Uh, Cindy's going to talk about uh, NSWC Carter Rocks's, uh, Carter Rocks discussion research collaborative efforts that we are performing, that they're performing and coordinating with the COVID PPE effort. John is going to speak about uh, Keyport's rapid response to COVID-19 using uh, their, their approved authorities. And Dan is going to talk um, from Portsmouth Naval Shipyard on how they stepped up to support PPE and manufacturing. Uh, so, Rich, take it away. Great. Thanks, Ashley. So, uh, should be there. Working right. Uh, let me know if you can hear me okay. Just send me a note. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going here. So, really good to be on uh, this, uh, the CPI chat. First opportunity to speak on this. I think uh, I realize that the platform itself is a bit challenging, but it's yeah, fun trying to learn to figure out on the fly here, you know, like we're doing today and every day now. As we're uh, trying to uh, get through the current circumstances. So I wanted to talk a little bit, a couple of things. One, uh, a little bit about what ONR has done internally to step up. And I think that's really important as well because we have a incredible workforce that needs uh, to, to stay connected across from the S&T, both large community outside the Navy as well as inside the Navy, and that's very important. So internally for us, obviously, we've all gone to the telework function. As in fact, I had to go to the building the other day just to grab my computer to bring it home. Uh, gave up kind of a Moby key. And it's kind of pleasant to see there was no one around. So everybody's doing their job by staying home. That's great. Uh, importantly, on a weekly basis, CNR does go out with a webinar to the command to make sure he's communicating effectively, taking questions, trying to find, provide updates. We get an awful lot of uh, emails uh, on guidance and so forth, 
it's, it's it's apparently it's kind of hard to keep track of that because it changes daily at times. So it's really important, I think, that CNR steps up each week and uh, provides an update on that information as well as answers to questions that are concerned for the our, our workforce internally. And of course, externally, we do uh, a lot of great things as well. But I think there's a couple of pieces of that, that I wanted to point out is that I think it came up that uh, I mean there's a lot of great work going on the immediate. Uh, COVID response, and I'll touch on that a bit. Uh, some of the things that uh, basically uh, some of the warfare centers, particularly through the tech bridges and their partners have done, but also we're we're pushing forward in a range of other things. I think Secretary Gertz made that point that this is the, you know, we may be in this current situation, but the reality is, is that we need still need to maintain our capabilities and particularly maintain the defense industrial base. And one of the things I really like to hear, I know we have a couple of people uh, it's been mentioned several times, and I think we're going to hear more about it, particularly with the shipyard capabilities, our depots, the importance of those in terms of maintaining our capability is absolutely essential. So one of the things that we have done uh, within ONR is uh, uh, we just recently just came up this week, issued a uh, out of cycle SBIR uh, to push forward with a particular title. It's engaging the defense industrial base. And so one of those topics, again, is we did it in a Rich, did we lose you? I think we lost Rich. So there, what's next, Ashley? Well, we can. Cindy, would you mind speaking? Cindy, are you available to start? Um, do you think we really lost Rich? Um, can you hear me? Um, hear me? I'm going to teach him how to troubleshoot. Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, very good. So um, I'm using the, trying to use the headphones, so maybe this all work well. So thank you all. Um, <laughs> We'll see. We'll see how this goes. I, I really appreciate this effort to try to get this video conferencing going. Um, I am one of those 27,000 engineers that um, Admiral Verhage mentioned, and I'm proud, really, to work with the talented, compassionate naval engineers um, and and the science workforce. And honestly, this workforce um, is perfect for this situation because they're able to use their knowledge and creative tools to assist in this effort. I mean, we are the people that should be helping with this, not just in our country, but around the world. And I know um, the, the ONR Global has, has brought forth some issues. So I really want to start, I did prepare a few words to try to keep on five minutes. I tend to go long, it's the professor in me. Um, but I want to start with the timeline and then share a bit of what we're doing. So. So we at Naval Surface Warfare Center Carterock, led by our CTO Dave Drazen, um, we met with the Food and Drug Administration and the VA hospitals representatives about a month ago. Um, hard to believe it's been a month, but um, it just sort of serendipitously happening happened that someone knew someone else, and and they were early in this effort to try to create the personal protective equipment. But out of that meeting. We all realized that we, at a, as a Naval Research Center, were the right people to help. We could help in a meaningful way and really um, get some of the actions done that they needed. So the so next came along Dave Newborn, who's one of our teammates at Carter Rock. He started a um, COVID-19 additive manufacturing rapid response team. We've been meeting every single weekday morning for 15 minutes. It's a rapid meeting since March 25th. Um, and, and it's going really well, kind of keeps us all on the heartbeat of what's going. So, so what we're trying to do is build those relationships, learn, and move quickly. So we're gathering, we, we are collaborating, we're coming up with ideas, we're troubleshooting. But in this complex situation, right, we, we shouldn't just depend on who's right around us, who's on this call. So, so we're really trying to... Um, work our networks, work our formal and informal networks, and collaborate with folks in the Navy at all the other warfare centers and shipyards, but also people um, outside of the Naval Enterprise. So we've been leveraging partnership um, with the ecosystem around us. I think one of the previous speakers said, or the question was asked, are you working with local areas? And the answer is yes. Um, some are, are, are 
folks at Carter Rock are working with Montgomery County in the state of Maryland. Um, we've tapped into our relationships with the other warfare centers. We're working pretty close with um, a variety of those warfare centers. Um, we are working with JAMWIG, which is the Joint Additive Manufacturing Working Group out of Department of Defense. So we've, we've mobilized and asked for information. Um, I've set up communication with some folks I know at um, the DOE additive manufacturing experts at the Oak Ridge Manufacturing Demonstration Facility. So we're sharing information and ideas back and forth. Um, so, so the bottom line is there's so many experts nationwide, we need to tap into them. But we need to get this information quickly. And we need to you know, get that action going quickly. So, so that's kind of a little bit of timeline about what we've been doing, but now I want to go on to kind of what, what we're, we're working on. So um, this is COVID, right? It's, it's, it's complex. There's a lot of variables, and, and we want to design, use equipment that is safe, um, but is based in some of our research-based science. And that's where, you know, I, I think Carter Rock and some of the research labs are really able to use our strengths. Um, we're using our vast knowledge of materials and characterizing and identifying proper materials and potential hazards. You know, if you put this mask over your mouth for 10 to 12 hours, do we need to worry about that polymer we use to possibly 3D print? Is 3D printing the right technique? Should we use other manufacturing techniques? What happens when we sterilize it? So we've got a study going um, with other, like the Air Force, with the Department of the Army, um, Jaime Santiago at, at Carter Rocks, kind of working in our polymer group, he's designing this study. Um, Susan Burton's leading some modeling work that we're doing at Carter Rock to help the, FA, um, the FDA and the VA hospital really understand their best fit design. So, so we're all doing what we can, and, and I think some of the previous speakers um, spoke about what the warfare centers are doing. We're trying to help with the local community. and so. Carter Rock is not a, a mass manufacturing center. We weren't designed to be, we're not supposed to be, but we still have mobilized and have been printing face shields for um, local hospitals and some of the other areas. But there's, there's more that we can do. We are, as I said, we're trying to use our, our expertise. We're trying to use our research, our, our resources, both human and our technical resources. Um, and, and all of that has to happen because this is a tough one. I mean, this is not one that we can see, right? And, and I say frequently that the additive manufacturing community, I would even add manufacturing community, um, they're great network. They're close network, even worldwide, right? Innovative, caring, we want to do. We don't want to just talk about it, we want to do. But these medical devices we're trying to recreate, they're complicated. We can't just reverse engineer you know, haphazardly. So, so that's where we can come in and help some of these other agencies to come up with a design that is been validated, that is safe. Um, I was talking to somebody last week, and I'll close with this. This is my little statement I came up, and I said, you know, to me, in my mind, this is a war. It's not against a human adversary, right? But it's certainly one that's going to affect our safety in the United States and the entire world. So with that, I can answer more questions when the time comes. Probably my five minutes is up. I will be quiet and pass the talking stick on to the next. Thank you, Cindy. John? Yes, good afternoon. I'm going to talk about three factors that uh, Nua Keyport uh, used in order to have success, both supporting the community as well as the fleet with personal protective equipment by overcoming supply chain issues. First, it was the Department of the Navy's leadership from the SECNAP through Secretary Gertz, as you heard him talk about trust, through the CNO and our Nua Commander, Admiral Verheg. And the message that they sent us out in the field was, we have your back. And this allowed us to lean forward, use our authorities that we had granted, innovate, and to, to move out. And we have your back is a powerful message that we can um, both receive and provide as a leader. So that's what provides us the trust and acknowledges the risk that we have um, going forward. So the second with the trust is personalization. And this led to our success early on uh, because it led to urgency. So we heard early on from 
uh, the Naval Hospital CO of the challenges that she was having with PPE. Uh, we used our connections to hear from the hospitals, uh, local hospitals, of the challenges that they were having on the front lines with PPE. And then many of us um, have uh, know someone personally in the medical field, uh, including my sister. And having that personalization and having that face tied to the effort really drove uh, the urgency. So along with uh, the trust from Department of Navy leadership, the personalization that we had in order to drive urgency, the third factor that we had uh, was the collisions. And here's where I'll spend a little bit of the time talking about collisions and how they become actionable and how we use this to our success at Keyport. The collisions first came into the lexicon of uh, Keyport uh, after reading Tony Shea's book, um, and he's the CEO of Zappos. And he was a huge proponent of having collisionable hours of individuals in order to share ideas, drive diversity in thought, and crowdsource solutions to problems. And so using these collisions, uh, we use it to find a way to get to yes for PPE to support um, our local community as well as the fleet. And this traveled down two paths independently, and then they, uh, they met later on. The first path was through our engagement officer, Johannes Schoenberg. Johannes uses pre-existing relationships that was built with the Pacific Northwest Test uh, tech bridge, as well as Naval X. And having these relationships helped them collide with Impact Washington uh, that we locally have a partnership inter intermediary agreement with. And this tied key port into the manufacturers and the organizations such as Maritime Blue Innovation Center. This allowed key port to have uh, insight into the Washington state demand uh, for PPE and the challenges that they faced uh, locally and statewide. And this also drove an understanding uh, of the hospital's demand signal for PPE. So this led to a collision with CH CHI Franciscan, which is a local hospital group, and they had a problem with an obsolete positive air pressure respirator hood. So we'll call that a, a, a PAPR. And these PAPRs are obsolete, um, and the face shields that they use uh, become damaged over time and don't maintain pressure. And these are the uh, full suits uh, that the hospital personnel use uh, when they uh, intubate a ventilator, so they're extremely important uh, during the COVID crisis. So we turn that uh, over um, to our code 32, uh, which has the engineers in order to reverse engineer ways to um, replace these hoods. And um, also code 32 does additive manufacturing. And this resulted in the second collision path. As Dr. Waters was, was talking about earlier, those relationships, the additive manufacturing, um, relationships that they have. And it just so happened that a member of our workforce, Bryce Webbs, uh, Weber, was tied into the local Kitsap maker community uh, led by Steve Ward. And this maker group um, is a, a civilian group out in town that was designing face shields uh, using hobby 3D printers for hospital and emergency responder use. So Keeper brought in Steve um, to learn the lessons learned that he was uh, figuring out on the face shield from the maker community to improve our design. And then we used the internal funds uh, to research our maximum output that we could do uh, to supply face shields to the community if needed. So now we have the demand signal uh, from our connections with Johannes um, and the uh, tech bridge. And then we also had the, the know-how um, with the, um, the face shields. So we turned this over uh, through another collision with our patent attorney, Gene Zoldowski, and Gene moved out quickly to identify the authorities, the requirements, and the applicabilities that we had. And she recommended a course of action. So we're able to use work with private partnerships under Title 10 U.S. Code 2539. Also did an MOA with the Hospital of Bremerton and a Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, or CRADA, with the University of Alaska, who also has a PAPR engineering needs. And of note, these agreements normally take three to five months, but um, through close coordination, uh, we did this in only three days while meeting all the requirements. And now that we had some wins, we leveraged these uh, to spread the word using local and national news uh, in order to um, get out um, our abilities uh, to those people uh, that have the need but no supply. And we, which resulted in collisions with uh, the fleet, uh, Naval Surface, Forces Pacific Atlantic, as well as uh, Strategic Warfare Center Pacific. So I'm proud of the effort, uh, the Keyports workforce, and their willingness to step up, to take risk, to learn, 
to overcome the obstacles and move forward. And our success was made possible by trust from our leadership, uh, personalization to drive urgency and find ways in our local authorities to have success and have actionable collisions in order to, to move forward and put ideas into action. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, John. I appreciate you for sharing that with us. Hey, Ashley, Dan? I just wanted to jump in, jump in real quick before Dan takes over. Sir, I apologize. Um, I know there's a lot, of, a lot of speakers going on. We just want to remind everyone, thank you for coming, and make sure you call a teammate, because right now we're able to talk with this 300 people we've had, but maybe you got someone out there that hasn't. So please reach out to your folks. It's really important during this time. Dan, back to you, sir. Maybe I scared him off. <laughs> Dan, Dan, you there? Okay, we can we can shift. Uh, uh, were we able to get Rich back? Not yet. Uh, uh, not um, yet. Working on it. Ashley, if you got a question, maybe maybe we get a question answered for any questions yeah, out there. For yeah, we actually, that's it. Yep, Cindy, yeah. got a question for you. Uh, okay. Is there anyone or any organization that you wish you had contact with as you work to solve the problem that you're getting? So I will be honest, um, I am one that is not afraid to pick up the phone and call. Um, so so I actually called Bryce Weber. Um, I met him and, and I feel like, you know, John, you were talking about relationships and collisions and trust and and honestly that's where that came about i had met bryce you know a year or so ago at an avid manufacturing national event um so so that was calling you know keyport i know bryce i know he can help and so so that started um you know i i would like to know more maybe of what some of the um oem possibly are doing but um, you know, I've also picked up the phone and called Oak Ridge National Labs. Lonnie Love is down there, and he um, kind of leads their, their manufacturing demonstration facility. They've got a big effort. So, um, you know, I picked up the phone and called Kelly Visconti. I mean, she runs the, the Joint Additive Manufacturing Working Group with DOD. And so there are great, um, great actions going on nationwide. I think the biggest challenge is, is how do we synthesize all that information, how do we, you know, make sure that, um, that, that, that we're doing the right thing? And, and I feel like um, at some point, and this is what's happening, and I, and I feel good about this, this action. I just had an hour and a half phone call right before this one with uh, um, NAVC05 um, leadership, and so the, the AM working group there on masks and shields. So, so what we're going to try to do is come up with a design that's acceptable to NIH and the FDA, but it's good enough, and then use our expertise moving forward to modify those recommendations as more information comes in. So, so you know, to answer the question, um, if someone thinks there's an organization we should be looking at and I should be in contact with, please let me know, and um, I, I will reach out for sure. Thank you, Cindy. You might have to come back in if you want to get your video so we can have you for the panel. Uh, Dan, thanks for rejoining us. I know that this has uh, you know, been some challenges to overcome, but if you'd like to share um, what your command is doing, yep, be our guest. Uh, so our journey is similar to uh, Keyport there. Starts off with a great idea from an employee who's interested in uh, open source 3D printing and looks for the need of supplying COVID-19 supplies. And decided, hey, wait a minute, we're a naval shipyard. We should be able to make this stuff. We can use it for our employees. He engaged our innovation group, which got leadership on board quickly. Within 48 hours, we were printing our first headbands and cutting the face shields. We used our excess machinery capacity and to drive a few dedicated employees to just do it around the clock. The hardest part, though, uh, as mentioned previously, was navigating the process of how do you take 
a government-produced piece of equipment and give it to a private partnership. Um, so like Keyport did, we utilized the Cooperative Research and Development Agreement um, and our laboratory status in order to be able to support local hospitals. Um, we gave the PPE to them at no cost, and we just asked for their feedback so we can continue to improve our design. Uh, we utilize this uh, for our work uh, in a lot of areas where we cannot maintain social distancing along with cloth masks. We also have an educational partnership agreement with the University of New Hampshire, and we partnered with them in their 3D printing capability to expand our capacity. Uh, we were able to produce enough face shields to more than support our needs here at the shipyard, and then uh, deployed those also to our local federal, federal fire department and naval security forces. Um, we then took the extra uh, through our co uh, cooperative agreements and sent them out to local first responders and hospitals that were in need. We've distributed about 5,000 face shields to the community and we also provided 1,500 face shields to the USNS Comfort down in New York supporting the uh, the battle against COVID down there. And of course, since innovation never ceases, uh, we've been experimenting with new products, including intubation boxes and printing COVID test swabs with our elastomer printing capability. It's just absolutely amazing to see what a dedicated group of a few individuals can do when they uh, put their mind to it, when they've got the drive and, uh, and also a, a a desire to help and support the community. This is a really big win for us, having not been in a fleet concentration area. It's really hard for the local community here to understand why an organization like our size, that is our size, is still operating when most of the business around here has shut down. But as I was talking to our city manager the other night, she mentioned that their fire department responded to a call with a in a house. Uh, where there was a suspected COVID-19 uh, person, and they utilized the PPE that we had given them to keep their firefighters protected. So that uh, that's one of those great stories that uh, just uh, really, really resonates with our folks in the community. Over. All right, thank you. Uh, we also have Rich Carlin back. So welcome back, Rich. Do you mind popping in and continuing where you left off? I think we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Now we can. Was there a particular place you wanted me to start back at? <laughs> well, let's let's listen you up with the uh, the question we had from earlier that was on how uh, we are working better with small businesses to keep things going at this time. Yeah, so we had a couple of things. I don't know if I covered it, but uh, if it came through or not, but we just did an outer cycle SBIR in particular, focusing on the. Uh, uh, the actual call is called engaging with the defense industrial base, which is this reach. A big piece of this is how do we make sure that the small businesses that support support our defense industry base are still going to be viable when during this period of time, as well as particularly when we go back to uh, more normal operations and into the future. So we've covered a couple of things in that particular area that uh, I think was really important because I know that was uh, some of the other speakers were going to talk about that. I'm assuming they did which was uh, one is our shipyard capabilities. How do we improve our uh, modernization and sustainment of the shipyards? Another topic area too was in digital logistics. I think we've discovered that logistics challenges uh, can go south very, very quickly. I think we learned that from the last uh, uh, few weeks and what can happen there. And we know that that's uh, been a challenge even within the, uh, across the uh, Department of the Navy and all services. And so that's a topic we put in and in fact, we've been working with the Defense Logistics Agency on some of those activities as well, because that, they are key to this equation. You can't do anything without ensuring DLA is involved. Uh, as well as one of the pieces that using our tech bridges, how we've been uh, utilizing the tech bridges to really rally support uh, around 
addressing the immediate problem uh, for the, the COVID activities, uh, protecting capability that we have there. A uh, big piece of that was up in uh, Newark Keyport as with Newark Newport, in which they uh, were able to use uh, their capabilities that they have there locally to help out the, the local hospitals. And one of the activities, which is pretty neat, which is we had one of our performers up in Alaska, who they are, she actually became, she's actually the lead for the COVID response up there in the state with the uh, University of Alaska and Fairbanks. And they did not have the ability to do certain parts that they needed at their hospital. And so Keyport stepped in, helped them uh, reverse engineer the parts, and they had the machines there to manufacture those parts. So they sent those up to Alaska. And when you talk about logistics, if you want to see one of the biggest logistics challenges that the United States has, not counting some of our overseas locations, uh, up in Alaska, if you realize that, how difficult it is to get parts up there. So it's a couple of things we've been doing, also working with Manufacturing Station Partnership and this, and working with them, and not just in terms of the manufacturing piece, but also, very importantly, ensuring that we maintain the workforce across the area. That That's key to, uh, every, I think everybody knows if you're tracking this, that's one of the biggest concerns. How do we make sure that our workforce is still going to be strong and capable as we get through this period and as we move into the future? And so. We've been working with them, particularly with the, to maintain that manufacturing workforce that is absolutely essential to our the shipyards in those areas, the small business communities. I know that was talked about a little bit earlier. But I think that kind of covered that, hopefully, or recovered some of it, maybe. Over. All right, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, just to remind everyone that the question and answer portal is over to the bottom left. We're doing our best to answer those and also take some and, and uh, make sure they get vocalized. So as you have questions, please do um, uh, submit them there. Uh, there's a quick question for you, uh, John. Uh, can you please repeat the book title mentioned? Uh, someone wants to look it up. So that's a softball question, but please. Yeah, everyone loves book recommendations. Loves book the, uh, yeah, just, I, if you if you Google um, Tony Say, so actually just Google CEO Zappos and his name will come up. It's Delivering Happiness. Um, but it, it's also referenced in a bunch of, uh, you know, self-improvement books and uh, leadership books. So Delivering ha Happiness, Tony Say. Um, we'll take note of that. Uh, next question we have for the group. Um, can you comment on the fact that email traffic has decreased dramatically, resulting in more positive time to doing tasking relating to one's job? Uh, this might be a new culture change. Uh, so that was a comment coming from someone. So how do you feel about uh, the, uh, the current environment and how it's impacting culture change that might last longer and potentially lower email inbox inboxes. So, so I can't say that my email inbox has decreased, and um, actually the opposite. I feel like it's increased, but um, it certainly is refreshing around the living around the D.C. area, not having to drive into work. But um, what do others think? Mine's increasing, so. Yep. I would agree with you. Mine's tripled. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Let's Maybe this will. Uh, maybe this will. Yeah, and to maybe repeat that for folks, uh, Rich said he gains about two hours a day just for not commuting. Great. Um, so I guess this is a good time to talk about a question from someone named Anastasia Cope. Have there been any teleworking issues or pain points? Uh, this is obviously a good example of one right now, but feel free. Oh, 
Well, I, I think that, um, you know, people that, work, uh, Dan, I guess, people that work in the lab all day long, I mean, it's, it's been a challenge. I know that um, at Carter Rock and probably the same with the other warfare centers, um, they're kind of careful when they are going to go in the lab when we got our 3, 3D printers working. Um, Scott Ziv has is, is managed all of our face shield manufacturer for the added manufacturing group, and, and they usually check in to make sure not too many other people are there. Um, one thing I did fail to mention, though, part of what um, I believe other warfare centers are doing, but I know Carter Rock has done, is we're printing personal protective equipment for our, our workforce. Um, we may not be giving all, we have given face shields to um, the appropriate, you know, following the guidelines of NAVC05, but, but we have been printing some face masks um, of a frame type for our own workforce. You know, so if you do have to be working six feet or less, you know, close to each other, which happens at times, right? You just can't get around it. Um, we are trying to help out our own workforce. So, um, yeah, but the telework, we're, we're doing a pretty good job. I mean, I'm, I've been surprised. These teleconferencing, um, it, it works in the daily check-in. A question for Rich Carlin. Um, I think I think your time at ONR may maybe informs your decision. So the, the Department of Navy is pretty used to a clear schedule of when things occur. Um, you know when certain calls for proposals go on, uh, when certain uh, processes need to be um, you know executed, and schedule cost and performance impacts. Um, from your vantage point. Um, how are we doing in mitigating that, and how much has the pandemic had an effect on our cost schedule and performance? So, a couple things on that, and I think the if you if you look at some of the some of the calls that annually go out, a lot of those have been really driven by OS from the S and T side, the OSD. So some of those have been delayed, so we don't really control that space. In terms of how we're doing things, if uh, clearly there's uh, and there's guidance on that for grants and contracts, so I'm not going to go into all the details of that. But ONR is taking a very active role in, in making sure that the performers uh, continue work when they wish to, but very importantly, take safety into account uh, in terms of that's that's the desire. We do we do follow the directive that if uh, what we do is defense critical infrastructure capability, so that, that allows people to do that work. And this communication, I think uh, Secretary Gertz mentioned this reach out to 2,500 performers, uh, trying to understand what everyone probably has some unique needs. In some cases, they're, they're, they're looking for uh, future no-cost extensions, which is anticipated. Some cases, they're doing some, uh, I don't want to call it full pivots, they're still in the scope of work, but doing work. At, that they can carry out for telework and maybe limited access to their facilities and so allow them to continue to move forward on that. We told the university people, finally, maybe you're going to send those reports and papers you promised me for the last month. Write some proposals. So there's things that a lot of people can do, and we do find that under our programs. A lot of the people we actually fund are in the cyber world as well, and so they have that capability. If they're not, can't do it from the house because of the security reasons, they can probably access some uh, facilities that allow that. Uh, and so we're looking at how do we anticipate and support all of our performers in terms of carrying that out. And like I mentioned, this out of cycle SBIR. So if anything, we're pushing forward on that uh, in terms of doing that. And I think it was brought up that a lot of the contracting is actually, in some ways, the conductivity there is actually moving faster. And so we want to give a shout out to Lakehurst, who helps us push out these SBIR awards. So they're helping us really push dollars out to the companies that are going to be critical to uh, sustainment and then uh, actually eventually growth of our defense industrial base. Thank you, Rich. Um, Dan, uh, in your role at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, do you have any other insights on how this is impacting your your schedule cost of performance? Uh, so, one thing we did was early on in the in the pandemic, we provided the opportunity for our vulnerable, most vulnerable workforce, those that were deemed by the CDC to be high risk for a serious illness to um, be at home. Um, so 
that obviously has had some impact to what we do as a portion of our workforce um, was at home. So trying to find creative ways for those that can't telework because they might be production workers. So for example, we have mask force. And so instead of our sale off making cloth masks, we've created take home kits that we've sent home with, we deliver to work some workers that are at home so they can sew masks at home and still contribute to our, uh, to uh, the workforce production here. So trying to see how we can utilize everybody in every capacity. We were never very well set up to telework as a organization. 6,500 people here with 500 laptops. Uh, the big game changer came um, when we got permission to be able to bring desktops home and they put the Pulse Secure software on there so that folks could take their desktops home and engineers and such can work from home. Uh, that was that that made a huge difference for us. Over. All right. Another question about uh, groups who are unable to maintain six feet distance uh, and how they're able to uh, obtain masks. Um, that Cindy Waters has. So, uh, yeah, there's some folks who need you, Cindy. Uh, any, how would how would people come over and reach out to you if they need some support for PPE? So, they are at Carteroff. Is that CD? I'm not yeah, sure. Carter Rock, um, yeah. I will tell you yep, though. This is, yes. Um, so that person, um, they need to get a hold of Scott Ziv. Scott Ziv is coordinating that effort. Um, it's also, there's a TDP, so uh, the NAVAIR folks, Liz McMichael, um, has created a technology data package, um, and it is out there for all to see, um, Distro A, for the frame model of the um, mask. So it is there for people, and, and the beauty of it is, it, is its simplicity. Um, you need a fairly acceptable filter material, um, but the frame is really easy to, to Print and like I said, the TDP is um, is readily available. And um, Scott Zip, I'm going to just put that out there. Find him in the system. He will he will work with you for sure. Yeah, um, I guess I'll just have a quick question around the board then, um, or maybe just a yes or no. Would it be possible to get a list of some POCs and a description of who we would reach out to them for? that we can give higher leadership, but also people across the board. Cindy, is that possible? Or, or for the um, actual PPE, the, the efforts that are going on. Okay. Kind of both. So, so Ben okay. Buffard at NAV, um, now CO5, he's really leading the um, effort. He's got a great point of contact list for additive manufacturing and manufacturing um, nationwide for all the NAVC. So um, great, great effort being put out there. Um, so yes, those are those are available. Another question is, how are you guys connecting together? Um, I know that Rich is working with uh, New at Keyport, um, but have you been reaching out to other groups across the board or other local efforts and kind of comparing notes as you go through is the question. So I can speak for, for ourselves. Um, uh, Dave Newborn set up is wonderful. We've got a max.gov page. So that we are we are sharing um, best practices, data, documents. Um, now that's that is CAC enabled, um, but we're really trying to utilize um, some of our informal networks and formal networks. Um, another APAN site um, we can use for sharing information and and conferencing with the Joint Additive Manufacturing Working Group. So that's across Department of Defense. Um, Honestly, we're depending on telecoms and um, you know these large data sharing tools, but um, none of them are perfect. So if anybody has a perfect one, please let us all know. Absolutely. 
Uh, I guess we'll, we'll have time for one more question, and then we'll probably end on time at 6. Um, our last question is going to be for all the panelists. So if, uh, if we can get uh, Dan back, great. And if not, we'll have to work with, uh, you know, without him. But uh, around the board, um, what has been the single best uh, news story that you've heard since this thing started? Uh, Captain uh, John Moretti, we'll, let's start with you. The, the biggest news story is is the willingness of the team to to learn lean forward and take some and take risks, um, knowing that uh, we'll support them. And it's it's interesting. I'd uh, um, early on in the AM, I've always been pushing innovation, lean forward. I've got your back. And then um, the AM team was going a bit faster than I thought they would were going. Um, so then. The audio didn't match the video, uh, so so I slowed them down, and I should have uh, I should have treated that a little bit differently. We eventually got back on track, um, but I think the you know the workforce. I mean, lean forward. We have people making masks, um, you know, at home uh, to provide to the workforce. Uh, people finding new ways to do businesses uh, to maintain the, the productivity. Uh, so it's. Uh, I think um, going forward, uh, we're looking at processes and not uh, exactly as um, Secretary Gertz said, not back to normal, but back to the new, better normal. And I think uh, uh, it'll be. Uh, Dan, do you mind going next? If you heard the question. No, I I absolutely agree. It's it's awesome to see the folks that. Um, see a need and take the initiative and go solve the need. For example, we decided we we're going to put out sanitization stations all around the shipyard for people so they had ready access to hand sanitizer. But we couldn't get any, so then we had to end up making our own. Um, so it's all these innovative solutions to what every day would normal would be a simple problem, cleaning supplies. We ended up having to make our own. I sent a driver to New Jersey to pick up seven 55-gallon drums of hand sanitizer because we couldn't get it shipped up here. So it's just everybody doing, going out of their way, seeing a need, and just uh, taking the initiative to go fill it because uh, there just isn't a normal way of doing it. Um, and then I agree, uh, what is the new normal going to look like is uh, pretty exciting. Uh, Cindy, do you want to go next? I'm now. I think one of the one of the best news stories, and and this is kind of a, a selfish news story also, because one of my sons is a internal medicine doctor. Um, he's he's now in he's in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, so it's not really bad there. But I will tell you the stories that I've seen on the news of people celebrating and just clapping for the healthcare workers. I mean, you know, we think some of the situations are rough, but can you imagine? I mean, I can't imagine um, being on the front line of this effort. And I think that's what, you know, really tears at people's heartstrings and, and causes these um, efforts that, that we're all seeing in our labs. And, with the, you know, the young engineers at Carteroff just working over the weekend and on their own time to, to find what's best and practice what's best and trial and error and, um, really, it, it warms your heart and it makes you hope that we, um, as, as Secretary Gert said, we, we end up with a better new normal, that we can maybe treat each other, who knows, a little better. Awesome. And Rich? Uh, Rich, do you want to go next? And it, for myself, so, so I, I feel like I'm going to be piling on here, but that's exactly the same thing. So I, the, the stories that we hear nationally about the people that are really putting their life on the line for these activities and the people that are doing everything they can within the, uh, their abilities and using those resources. And I, what I really, really, really liked seeing was it was literally over the course of a weekend that I, I mentioned the short story on that, which was the uh, Keyport uh, who st stood up and said, we can look local hospitals, they identify how that happened. And literally a couple days later, we have a forum in Alaska. So it wasn't just that local, the 
how everybody came together across the country, even when we're separated by thousands and thousands of miles, to immediately help each other. And that recognition of that, how everybody stepped up to do that, that was incredibly powerful. And I think that's something that we need to really capture. We talked about capturing things from this and capturing the ways that we communicated with each other and worked together to tackle these problems. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that we really appreciate people coming in and bearing with us for all the technical issues. But uh, we also know that we did not get to all the questions that were asked. We are not leaving those behind. We're going to actually export all of the questions and make sure that we have information uh, to send out to everyone uh, on responses. So if you haven't gotten a question answered, please reach out to Agility. Um, at navy.mil um, and we will have it documented and we are definitely trying to get them all answered. Uh, additionally, um, we're going to be exporting all the comments and stuff uh, even inside of the chat. So we'll be going through uh, and taking all of those links that you see people posting and putting them in a one pager or something that we can show everyone. So uh, we have all of these lists of information that are that are being shared uh, with the entire group here. Uh, so. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Matt for a closeout. All right. Ready to do like a dance party for the closeout or no? Maybe? All right. Can't tell because no I can't see anybody. Uh, we really appreciate it. Oh, there's Ashley. She's jumping in. There we go. go wave Always there. ready for the extrovert time. There's some rich. There we go. Uh, we really appreciate everybody jumping in. We know there was some uh, struggles with some things, but I hope you gained some, some value and some knowledge out of this. Thank you to the presenters that did this. Thank you to everyone who participated, who watched, who listened, wherever you are. We will, we will be cutting this up and getting some of this out on YouTube in the next, probably give us some time to do that. And there were some questions on if we can get it captioned, and yes, we will get it. The parts that were hard to hear will get captioned to the best of our ability so that we can disseminate this to you guys as well. So we really appreciate it. Uh, remember, it's crazy times. Every, no one knows what's going on. Just like a lot of people have said today, just do what you can. Ashley's pulling her hair out. Clearly, I shaved all mine off. It was getting in my way. Uh, just do what you can. Reach out to a friend or a coworker. Let's do this together. And thank you and fantastic day. Thanks for joining, everybody. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.